Hey everybody, it's Mike and welcome to Chip Damage. And today we're talking about No-G. We're talking about the original Xbox. Now, despite its massive girth and the monolithic support from Microsoft, when the Xbox launched back in 2001, it was really an underdog system. You have to remember, the PlayStation 2 had been out for already a year and a half and was the most successful video game console of all time. And the Xbox was also launching in the same week as the GameCube from Nintendo, a company that had had two decades of experience releasing home consoles. And just because a large company was backing the console did not guarantee success. Remember, in the decade prior, other giant companies had tried to launch consoles and had failed spectacularly. You can look at Philips launching the CDI, which will go on to sell only 670,000 units. The 3DO, which had massive backings from multiple companies, would sell only 2 million units. And even Atari's Jaguar would only sell a quarter million units in its life. So the original Xbox was really a gamble. And in the end, it pulled it off. It eventually sold 24 million units, which in comparison to the 155 million uh, that the PS2 achieved, doesn't sound like much. It did beat out Nintendo's GameCube by over 2 million units. And it would go on to spawn the Xbox 360, which was something of the defining console of the seventh generation. And yes, a big part of that success was due to the popularity of Halo and the success of the Xbox Live service, which normalized console online gaming. But Microsoft really made it a push to appeal to all types of gamers by going out and developing and getting other, other developers to make some really special and unique and great games. But unfortunately, a lot of them aren't talked about. So that's what we're gonna do here today. I kinda wanna go over the original Xbox games that are kind of forgotten, not talked about, the rare ones and the generally more weird ones that I've been able to gather in my collection. So yeah, let's see if we can find some more appreciation for the giant X-Bone. All right, we're gonna start with Call of Cthulhu, a survival horror title. Now, this was originally an Xbox exclusive. It came out on PC about a year after its Xbox release. And unfortunately, it's never been re-released in any other form. And what this game is, it's pretty unique. It's a first-person horror game. The story follows Jack, a detective who goes to Boston, and like many Lovecraft stories, gets involved in the occult. Uh, there's amnesia, there's monsters from beyond involved. And there's some really unique gameplay features in this. So um, in the first person's pr perspective, you have no HUD. Everything you uh, do to yourself, every d piece of damage that you take, you need to interpret through Jack's actions. If you your leg is injured, you'll limp. If your arm is injured, you won't be able to aim correctly. There's no reticle. You need to aim directly down the sights and fire. You need to count the bullets in your gun. There's nothing indicating how much ammo you have. If you take too much damage and start losing blood, color will leave the screen. It was really interesting. And one of the more fun uh, aspects of the game was also found in Eternal Darkness was the insanity meter. Now, it was a little different. The more you look at occult objects or upsetting imagery, Jack would start to like lose his mind and you'd hallucinate and eventually you'd end up killing yourself if you ended up looking too much. It was fun, it was scary, and it can only be found on the original Xbox. This one is really forgotten, probably due to the fact that it was released really late. And it is an interesting note, this was actually produced by Bethesda of all people uh, before they found super success with Oblivion. So yeah, if you're looking for a survival horror game on the original Xbox, you can definitely hunt this one down. It's not too expensive. The Xbox didn't have a ton of survival horror games, but this was a gem that not many people talk about. I'm not sure why, but if you have the system, definitely go find this one. All right, moving on to a game in the horror vein, but not really a horror game, is the Classic Stubbs the Zombie. Yeah, this was miraculously just announced to be getting a re-release on modern consoles, the Xbox One, PS4, and Switch, and I, I can't believe it because this game is really out there. It's a great game, but it, it's really something you didn't expect to see uh, get a re-release. Uh, to start, this game was famously advertised as running on the Halo engine. That is so misleading. This game has nothing to do with Halo. It's not a first person shooter. It doesn't really look like Halo. Uh, it was just a name put on the box to sell copies. But that aside, let's talk about the game itself. So you play as the titular Stubbs, a 
traveling salesman who dies in the 30s and resurrects as a zombie in the 50s, and you decide to take your revenge on the world by doing what zombies do, eating brains. You raise an army of the undead, you take revenge on the townsfolk, and then some wacky stuff happens because, uh, I forgot to mention, this game is totally played for laughs. Like, you need to attack the police station and you end up getting into a dance-off with the chief of police. And speaking of dance-off, the most memorable thing about this game, uh, and it's something I really hope gets uh, brought over fully intact in this uh, aforementioned re-release, is the soundtrack. This game brought together a ton of rock and alternative rock artists to do a soundtrack of 50 songs, but with a modern sound, a modern alternative sound. Some bands would go on to be huge. Uh, two standouts to me are My Boyfriend's Back by the Ravenettes, and even though I'm not a tremendous fan of the band, Death Cab uh, for Cutie performed Earth Angel. Th they're so catchy. You will download the soundtrack to this. I'm really hoping they bring that over. So yeah, Stub the Zombie, a zombie revenge game played for laughs with a crazy rockabilly soundtrack. Please check this one out. As a note, uh, this game was really re-released on the Xbox 360 for about three or four years, but was delisted because it was very buggy. Uh, and uh, it was otherwise completely unavailable other than original hardware until the announcement of this miracle re-release. So yeah, Stubs of the Zombie, check it out. Uh, you can get that on there. Hopefully it has that soundtrack, but if it doesn't, you can always go back and get it on the OG Xbox. Okay, uh, moving on. I just want to mention that the original Xbox never got popular in Japan. It just couldn't get a foothold there. And that's a real shame because it wasn't for a lack of trying. Microsoft hired some amazing Japanese studios to make some really special games. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. The first of which is going to be the Otogi series. Now, I've mentioned these games in other videos, but I want to talk about them again because these are two of my favorite Xbox games and two of my favorite games of all time. So, these were developed by From Software before Demon Souls, before they became the super popular company that they are today, but you can kind of sense the DNA. This is a third person action game where you kill demons and it's pretty difficult and there's a lot of secrets that aren't said. It's just things you find, things you unlock. Uh, the Moonlit Sword, which is found in most uh, From Software games, is of course unlockable in these. And I must say, they're more akin to Devil May Cry, but more floaty. Th these games you play as the Demon Slayer Raikou, and this is all about air combat and destructible environments. Uh, it was very famous for those destructible environments. You fight an army of demons, and when you hit them with your weapons, you send them flying. They'll break through the trees. They'll leave indents in the ground. Things will get shattered. It's a really impressive effect. And speaking of weapons, the first game has a variety of about 33 weapons, and they all have different effects. Some are two-handed swords, one-handed swords, lances. They, some can set enemies on fire. Some make you jump higher. And speaking of jumping, by the end of this game, you will be making 40-foot verticals, double jumping. Raikou falls to the ground very slowly. This is a really fun game. You just wreak havoc in this game and fight some really intense Japanese folklore-inspired enemies. I strongly suggest you hunt this down. It's not very expensive, but it is only found on the original Xbox, which is really a shame. I'm really hoping that From Software does some type of collection for their classic games because this is something that should be played. And as a note on the second one, which was released a year later in 2004, I believe this is equally as good. Some say it's better, some say it's worse. I say it's right there with the first one. Instead of having 33 weapons, you only have three, but you have six playable characters who are all very different. Each one of them has three weapons. It looks a little better, the gameplay is a little tighter, uh, and I really, yet again, couldn't recommend these enough. You can get these on the cheap, Please try them. You got a Togi Myth of Demons and then a Togi Two Immortal, Immortal Warriors from From Software. Please go find these. And sticking with Japanese games, we have a unique and odd exclusive for my fighting game fans, and that is SVC Chaos SNK versus Capcom. Do not confuse this with Capcom versus SNK, or you will be disappointed. So, what this is is the SNK produced game, or one of the SNK produced games that was part of a four game deal between SNK and Capcom to, to produce four fighting games. So strangely, this was an Xbox exclusive in North America. And that's very bizarre considering that the Xbox wasn't exactly known for its Japanese fighting games. Um, and that the Capcom vs. SNK games were found on all three major consoles at the time, uh, Xbox, PS2, and GameCube. So many people do not like this game, but I think it has a certain charm. It has 36 characters, 
from uh, half being from SNK, half being from Capcom, and it's a very unique roster. Uh, almost every versus game out there, of course, has like Morgan from Dark Stalkers. You don't find her in this. You find Dimitri. Not too many games have him. This is the origin game of Violent Ken, who would go on to be an Ultra Street Fighter two years later. So if you thought he was just some random throw in in that game, he wasn't. He was a random throw in in this game. And this game has the SNK King of Fighters sprite style, very meaty, very thick and, and realistically proportioned. Uh, they redrew all the Capcom characters, so if you're expecting like the same 2D sprites that you found in Marvel vs. Capcom or Capcom vs. SNK, no, they're very different, a little bit more realistic in this. Um, it has a slew of SNK characters, of course, my boy Terry Bogard. You have characters from Samurai Showdown. Uh, you have people from <laughs> Metal Slug, including the... the, the, the squiddy Mars people. It's like a squid alien with a gun. Zero from Mega Man appears in this. It's a really wacky and fun game. The only problem with it is you know, the backgrounds and the music are atrocious, but the gameplay is solid. SNK and Capcom do not mess around when it comes to fighting games, especially in this era. Uh, this is a cheap game, so if you're a fighting game fan, if you're a King of Fighters fan or a Street Fighter fan, hunt this down. Um, it's not the prettiest game in the world, but it's worth playing, and strangely, it is only on the original Xbox in North America. It has not been re-released in any form. Uh, hopefully it will be one day, but until that day, you have to get it on the Xbox. All right, another Japanese title with that is both famous and infamous. I've talked about this series before on the channel, so uh, let's talk about Shenmue 2. Okay, so Shenmue 2 is a Dreamcast game in every other region of the world other than North America. For whatever reason, when it was brought here, it was made into an Xbox exclusive. Now, that's not an entirely bad thing. Um, the Xbox version as seen here did have some enhancements. It looks a little better. You can add like a film gradient to the game to make it look like an old Hong Kong movie. And it's it's solid. Uh, I'd say this is overall a better game than Shenmue 1. I mean, you can still kind of fall asleep at certain parts, but it's interesting. Ryo, the character of this game, uh, instead of being in his hometown in Japan, you're in Hong Kong, a bustling city, and there's plenty of things to do. Um, one of the best things about this over the original is that you can speed up the in-game clock so you can get to shops and your job, like quicker and you don't have to just wander around and wait for the clock to go by. You can just immediately speed it up. There's some weird ways to make money in this game. You don't have to get a job. You can get like money playing pachinko or arm wrestling or fighting. Or, uh, and of course you, there's all those little bonuses like finding um, like little quarter games where you can unlock figures from other Sega games. It's a fun game. And as a collector's note, if you go to pick this up, Make sure you get both discs. There's, of course, the game disc, but there's also the Shenmue movie disc, which is unique to North America, where all the cutscenes of the original Shenmue are brought together and, and uh, watchable on your original Xbox, so you don't have to play through the uh, original game. Uh, so this was re-released eventually on the PS4 in a double pack with Shenmue 1 and 2, but it is a notable piece of Xbox history. It is an odd exclusive, and I just wanted to bring it up here. It is also dirt cheap, so if you want to pick this up, uh, on the original Xbox, it's still a solid way to play it. So yeah, Shenmue 2. Okay, yet again, another Sega game. Uh, many people consider the Xbox a spiritual successor to the Dreamcast. Uh, that's one way you could look at it. I don't know if I see it that way myself, but I do kind of like characterizing Sega as trying to get back at Nintendo and Sony for killing the Dreamcast by siding with the Xbox. So maybe a part of that is this following game, and that is Crazy Taxi 3. So many people don't talk about this game. Many people remember the original Crazy Taxi set in California and maybe even the New York ones, uh, Crazy Taxi 2 um, on the Dreamcast. But uh, this one gets overlooked a lot. Crazy Taxi 3 has a stage from Crazy Taxi 1 uh, set in California and Crazy Taxi 2 in New York, but the main part of the game actually takes place in Las Vegas. And it's a cool look. Uh, the Crazy Hop, the ability to jump returns from Crazy uh, Taxi 2. Now, I don't think this is the best game in the series. I still think Crazy Taxi 2 is the best, but there are some cool things about it. it the, the entire cast from Crazy Taxi 1 and 2 can be unlocked uh, in addition to the drivers in this game. The, you know, of course you have that Offspring soundtrack brought back. It's not quite as good as the first two games, but it's worth checking out. Strangely, unlike the other two games, uh, this was not re-released in any form whatsoever. This is still an Xbox exclusive. So if you want some fun driving action and have already played Crazy Taxi 1 or 2 to death, you have to go get Crazy Taxi 3 on the original Xbox. Still a solid driving game. Las Vegas is a cool setting. Check it out. 
Okay, now we're going into more Sega games released exclusively on the Xbox. Now, these following games, as a note, were released by Smilebit, a uh, small inside team in Sega that worked on the Prandial Dragoon games and go on to make a trilogy of pretty fun games on the original Xbox, some of which you may know. So let's talk about uh, probably the most famous one, that is Jet Set Radio Future. I love this game. Um, many people know this game and Jet Grind Radio, the original, or Jet Set Radio as it would be known later. Uh, it was a Dreamcast release, and this release, the sequel, is still, to this day, an Xbox exclusive. Now, uh, as a collector's note, there are two versions of this game, or packages of this game, as it were. There's what you see in front of you, the first release, uh, where it is a, a single release. It's just Jet Set Radio, but the much more common variant out there is a double pack with Sega GT. Same exact game, however, I really like the packaging on this original release. It's got like a metallic sheen and, you know, I'm not a big racing fan, so I'm not, I really didn't want Sega GT, I wanted this original box, but yeah. So the main differences in gameplay of this game over its predecessor is that there's no time limit. You can just walk, like, skate, as it were, around the entire world, spray painting, exploring. It's a lot of fun. The soundtrack is killer. Please, if for anything you get this game, you have to get it for the soundtrack. However, I believe after doing some research that that soundtrack is the reason this game hasn't been re-released. It is so odd to me that one of the most beloved games on the original Xbox has not been re-released at all over the last two decades. I'm really hoping it is, but if it's at the sacrifice of this soundtrack, I'm not sure I want it. I mean, you know what, scrap that. I'll still take it, I'll complain, but at least uh, a new generation will be able to play this game. But for the time being, if you want to play one of the most stylish games ever made, you have to get it on the original Xbox. And that is this game right here, Jet Set Radio Future. Don't sleep on it. Check it out. Hopefully we get that re-release one day. All right, the next Smile Bit game, a direct sequel to a Sega Saturn game. This one's pretty well known. And that is Panzer Dragoon Orda. So this is the fourth and final Panzer Dragoon game. Um, after Panzer Dragoon Saga, the third game on the Saturn, the team went back to the rail shooter style of the first two Panzer Dragoon games and released this gem. So think of Star Fox, but with dragons. I always say that when describing Panzer Dragoon. However, this is extremely refined. This is an amazing rail shooter to this day. And if you're playing it uh, on your original Xbox, it looks great. However, it is backwards compatible with the Xbox One X and Series X. And I strongly suggest you check it out on those consoles. This game is still gorgeous. It has a fantastic art style. Uh, yet again, quick story, you play as a girl named Orda on her dragon, fighting other dragons and monsters in an evil empire. It, it's not about the story, it's about the gameplay. It's flashy, it's beautiful, it's got green soundtrack. It's also got really cool unlockables. There's two unlockables of note. Number one, you can unlock cutscenes from the prior Panzer Dragoon, Dragoon games. You can also unlock all of Panzer Dragoon 1. Yeah, the entire Panzer Dragoon 1 Saturn version is unlockable in this game. So you get half of the series on this one disc. Um, this is not hard to find. It has never been re-released, but strangely, it is not rare. I hope it never becomes rare because I want people to be able to play this game. And I'm so happy that Microsoft added this one to the backwards compatibility list. So yeah, Panzer Dragoon, Dragoon Orda, the fourth game, and unfortunately final game as of now on the original Xbox. And the final Smile Bit game. I've mentioned this game before as well in our uh, Xbox Gems video, but it's worth uh, repeating. And that is Gun Valkyrie. So this was originally a Dreamcast game to my knowledge, uh, but the development shifted to the Xbox later on. And this is a pretty unique game. It, it's, it's like a third person action game, but more focused on using your jetpack, which is like a jump jet more, and uh, shooting. And you fight alien giant insects. Like, you know, not quite Earth Defense Force, but you know, in that vein. It's very anime inspired, and I always think it's funny that it actually says on the back of the box, I know you can't see it, it says it's inspired by modern day anime. So yeah, you play as two characters, you play as uh, Kelly, the pretty girl you see on the cover, and Saburuta, like a very serious samurai who never uses a sword really. Um, and you go to a planet and you take orders from your commander, who's just a head, by the way. The commander uh, that gives you orders is literally a woman's head who is severed but somehow saved. And you go to a planet to find a mad scientist, the planet's covered in giant insects, and you fly and air dash and do special moves fighting these insects. This is a fun game. This is also a tough game. It's not often spoken about. It's never been re-released on backwards compatibility as far as I know. It has no re-release. It's probably never gonna get one. But it has that Sega weirdness, that Sega flair. Uh, and it's a really nice exclusive to get on the Xbox. Not expensive, but don't expect to find this one anywhere else. 
please check this one out, Gun Valkyrie on the original Xbox. Okay, moving on. Uh, as a note, the original Xbox is well known for its number of good Star Wars games. You have Knights of the Old Republic, you have the Jedi Academy and Knight games, you have Star Wars Republic Commando, a personal favorite of mine, and those are spoken about often, and they're beloved, and many of them are backwards compatible or re-released. The next one is none of those things. No one talks about this game, but we're talking about it on chip damage, and that is Star Wars Obi-Wan. Now, what to say about this one? It's bad, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't check it out. Uh, Star Wars fans, look at this one. This one's interesting. So what this is, is two years after Phantom Menace released, this game was released, and it is basically a retelling of episode one through Obi-Wan's eyes. And it actually starts a couple weeks before episode one. So if you're ever curious what Obi-Wan was doing beforehand, you'll find out in this game. He wasn't doing much interesting, but hey, you know, Star Wars fans like myself, I wanted to know. Uh, it goes all the way up to the very end of episode one, and you are not Ewan McGregor in this game. So the whole game looks like an N64 game. It's not pretty. It did not take advantage of the Xbox's power. Yet again, it kind of has a blocky charm, though. Uh, the voice acting, the imitating is just sort of like, Master Qui-Gon, we have to stop the Jin Ha. Uh, it's, it's laughable, but that's half the reason you want to check this out. Uh, as of note, it actually has a kind of fun multiplayer mode. It's a lightsaber duel where you, you just have one-on-one -on -one battles and arenas, and it is... It is wacky, it is fun. It's actually fairly in depth, the lightsaber combat. You control all the movements with the right stick and you block, uh, if you block at the right moment, you'll parry moves. Check it out for that alone. Just as a note, Mace Windu in this game and the multiplayer is completely broken. So if your friend picks him, just give up. You're not beating Mace Windu. I mean, I guess that's canon, that's appropriate. But yeah, Obi-Wan, janky Star Wars game on the original Xbox. But hey, Star Wars, uh, it's a piece of Star Wars history that isn't talked about a lot. So yeah, check it out. Okay, now we're talking about a slightly divisive game on the original Xbox, but I wanted to bring this one to light because I like this game, and that is Conquer Live and Reloaded. So, uh, if you don't know, Conquer's Bad Fur Day was a rare title, the company Rareware, uh, released on the N64 where you play as the titular Conquer, who is a very foul-mouthed squirrel. So if you're thinking this game is a cutesy game like Banjo-Kazooie, do not. Do not buy this for your younger siblings or children. Uh, Conquer is a smoking, drinking, horny squirrel who fights his way through a variety of movie-based levels while constantly, you know, saying insults and using bad language. It, it's a great game. Uh, and it was released very late in the N64 light, um, life cycle. And a few years later, Xbox would acquire Rareware. And they didn't do much with that license, as many know. It's infamously never produced many great games. However, they did do a re-release, uh, which is the game I'm holding here, Conquer Live and Reloaded, the remake of Conquer's Bad Fur Day. So the reason this game is divisive is that it, the language is slightly censored. Some of the worst curse words are bleeped out. However, it doesn't bother me that much. Like, yeah, it does kind of soften the edges of this game, but it's actually kind of funny in a South Park type of way to hear those curse words uh, bleeped. You do get some advantages in this version though. It is a great looking game. This was a very late life original Xbox title. In the original N64 game, which has been since released on the um, Rare Replay on Xbox One, uh, Conquer is very blocky, very smooth. There's not like, it doesn't look like he has fur. Every character that has fur in this game looks like they have real fur. It's a nice effect. The music is better. Uh, there's nice little touches. There's like a horror movie level you play through. And in this version, you wear Van Helsing's costume, you know, like the hat and the cloak. It's nice. I like both versions of this game, but I never understood the hate for this version. It's technically a better game in many ways. So if you want to play the original Conquer's Bad Fur Day, that's a great option. You can get that on the Xbox One version of the Rare Replay. Or you can get this game, and it is backwards compatible. So you can play both versions side to side on your Xbox One and uh, find out for yourself which one is better. However, don't sleep on this version. It's a great version to play. It's getting slightly more expensive as time goes on. It's slightly rare, but um, you can still get it for under 50 bucks. So check it out. Conquer Live and Reloaded on the original Xbox. Oh, and as a note, the live part of this uh, is referring to the Xbox Live multiplayer. That was sadly discontinued. I don't think that's a surprise, so you won't be able to play the actually kind of fun online multiplayer that this had, but uh, the, the campaign is quite long and fun, so you still worth it for that. Conquer Live and Reloaded. Okay, now uh, we are moving on to a title that just was very bizarrely, but very uh, excitedly added to the backwards compatibility list of the Xbox One and Xbox Series X, and that is Namco's Breakdown. 
No one talks about this game. This is an Xbox exclusive through and through. This has never been re-released. This never will be re-released. This was an experimental game on the original Xbox. So, what is this? This is a first-person, I wouldn't say shooter, first-person brawler. You play as Derek Cole, and the whole thing is that you were experimented on by the secret government facility with these interdimensional aliens DNA spliced into your own, and you fight through those interdimensional aliens uh, with your newly gained powers as well as firearms and, and uh, kung fu moves. However, the whole gimmick of this game is it never leaves Derek or the player's perspective. It is always in first person. Within the first five minutes of this game, you vomit into a toilet in the first person. Um, you do fighting game level moves. You do like flip kicks and spins and it's all in first person, so it can be disorienting. However, when it works, it works. It feels good to punch things in first person and it's got a great snappiness to it. It sounds good. The feedback is good. It is also incredibly difficult in the beginning of the game when Derek doesn't have many of his powers. It also has an incredibly frustrating aiming system with its weapons where when you aim at an enemy, you kind of lock onto them. However, there are four squares underneath the character and depending on how much you're moving, how close you are, the squares fill in and that's your indicator of how you're gonna hit things. So there's like no manual aiming in a game all about being in first person. It's really weird. However, this is a long campaign with some awesome boss fights that pro provide some real challenge and someone out there must like it because it is now backwards compatible like 15 years after it came out. Uh, it didn't even get a re-release. It is a simple release. This game is like $2.99 on eBay if you want it. Please check this out. No one talks about this. Derek's not appearing in any crossover. I hope one day that this game gets something, but I'll take the backwards compatibility. Breakdown, an original Xbox classic if you ask me. Okay, like I said, Xbox was really trying to push into Japan and they were trying to do it fast with uh, the series of games I'm about to talk about, which were all produced by Tecmo. I think you know where I'm going with this one if you're Xbox collectors. And we're gonna start with the launch title of Dead or Alive 3. Now to begin, let's get this out of the way. Dead or Alive, back in the day, before the fifth game, was a legitimate contender to Tekken as, a, as one of the best 3D fighting games out there. This series used to rock. Um, Dead or Alive 3 in particular was a launch title for the original Xbox. And for a minute there, this may have been the best looking console game. This game shocked people. Uh, everyone remembers that Xbox commercial where you see Kasumi do like her split kick and there's like that nerd watching the TV and go, oh, she kicks high. So they marketed their sexy female characters right off the bat, which, yeah, that's part of Dead or Alive, but that's kind of part of most fighting games. There's not too many ugly people, male or female, in most video games, but especially fighting games. Um, so don't sleep on this. Dead or Alive 3 is, very cheap these days. It's never been re-released. You can find this anywhere. It was released as a Platinum Hits, but never on further consoles. And it's got a solid combat system. Uh, a good cast of characters. Uh, lots of unlockable costumes. This was back in the day where you didn't buy costumes. You just unlocked costumes. Uh, there's scene transitions. Like if you knock someone through a stage, they fall to another area. They're really dynamic. They're really cool. The game still looks good today. And as a note, um, this game actually had a expansion pack that wasn't online. This was very weird, a costume pack. There were two ways to get more costumes in this game. There was a Xbox Magazine disc uh, released. You had to get the Xbox Magazine and this particular disc that came with it that you would insert into your Xbox and it would save a, a booster pack. And when you pop this game back in, there'd be more costumes unlocked. And I thought that was a really strange uh, thing to do. Uh, I had it, but I was always worried that other fans wouldn't be able to get it. However, they remedied that booster pack with the next title. And that is the Dead or Alive Ultimate Pack, which is a combination of Dead or Alive 1 and 2. So in the copy of uh, Dead or Alive 2, to follow up on what I just said, the booster pack was included. So if you bought this game and you still had Dead or Alive 3 and you popped this in, it would give you those costumes that were originally found on the magazine disc. I never thought that magazine was a good idea to uh, give DLC out on. But anyway, back to this game. Uh, this was pretty anticipated because Dead or Alive 3 was pretty beloved on the original Xbox. So they went backwards. They released Dead or Alive 1 and 2, a few years after Dead or Alive 3, and they really printed them up. Uh, starting with Dead or Alive 2, they took the Dead or Alive 3 engine and applied it to Dead or Alive 2, added a character or two here and there, and really, Dead or Alive 2, uh, and it's called Dead or Alive 2 Ultimate in most circles, is a beautiful fighting game on the Xbox. Great systems. One thing I always remember about Dead or Alive 2 Hardcore on the gameplay system is, <clears throat> excuse is... The counters in this game do too much damage. Dead or Alive is well known for its counter hold system where if you guess what your opponent's about to do and you press the right button at the right time, you'll counter them. 
In Dead or Alive 2 Ultimate, it, it does like a third of your health if you call it. So that's, I don't know if that's a plus or minus in your book, but it's just something I wanted to mention. Also, Dead or Alive 2, there are so many unlockable costumes in this game. All in the game included. Imagine that. Kasumi and some of the female characters, of course the female characters, have like 20 unlockable costumes. And you just get them by beating the arcade mode or beating hard mode or playing enough matches. You actually unlock great costumes by just playing the game. And that was a really great thing back then. Of course, the most difficult ones to unlock are the bikinis. Yeah, this is Dead or Alive. I did it. No shame. Loved them. I play in those costumes. But yeah, solid fighting game. And as a, more of a bonus than a bona fide game, you also got a uh, re-release of Dead or Alive 1. It's a port of the PlayStation version of anything that's been prettied up. Uh, it, it's nothing too special. It plays like those archaic 2D fighters that were released in that era, like Virtual Fighter or Tekken 1. I didn't put much time into it, but hey, it's a nice bonus. It's basically a free game with Dead or Alive 2 Ultimate, which, as a side note, this was the second online console fighting game released for the Xbox and one of the first online fighting games ever released, the first being famously Dead or Alive Deception. So I put dozens of hours of online into this game via Xbox Live, Dead or Alive 2, and it was a ton of fun. It had good lobbies. Unfortunately, they've all been disconnected. But yeah, I've spilled enough about this one. The Dead or Alive Ultimate Pack containing Dead or Alive 1 and 2. Even better than Dead or Alive 3, not, enough, not as many characters, but as... Just a prettier game uh, with harder hits. This counter's a little out of control, though, so, you know, keep that in mind. Dead or Alive 2, the ultimate. You can find this one pretty cheap. Please check it out, all my fighting game buddies out there. And um, continuing with Tecmo is a game very much associated with the original Xbox. One of my favorite games of all time. Maybe my favorite action game series of all time. And that is the Ninja Gaiden games. That's the original Ninja Gaiden and Ninja Gaiden Black. So, I was originally introduced to the... Uh, main character of Ninja Gaiden. It is, by the way, Gaiden, not Gaiden. I said Gaiden for years, but it's Gaiden. It means side story. It's weird that it said side story because it's not really a side story. I mean, it's the only story. But regardless, the main character of this, Ryu Hayabusa, is a playable character in Dead or Alive. Uh, and at the time, I did not even know about the original NES Ninja Gaiden games. Uh, they were way too hard for me as a kid, uh, even if I did know about them. But anyway, you play as Ryu Hayabusa in a full Devil May Cry style third person or character action game as they are called now, story. And th this game, the original, which released in 2004, was highly anticipated. Yet again, at the time of release, this may have been the best looking console game. I mean, even PC games at the time would have trouble contending with this one. And not only did it look beautiful, the gameplay was incredible. Um, it took the basis of third-person action games, like Devil May Cry, uh, but kind of sped them up and enhanced them. This is a third-person action game with the complexity and speed of a full fighting game. Every weapon you have in this game has like a 50-move 50, uh, 50 move list. This is something special. Uh, you, the basic plot is Ryu uh, is part of a ninja village. His village is attacked by a group of... They're not demons, they're fiends, but they're demons. Uh, and your legendary sword, the, the sword of the family stolen, you have to go get it back. Simple Saturday morning plot, uh, but that's not what you're going to play this for. This game's action is just so addicting. It's well known to be challenging, but the more you play, the more, the more you'll get better at this game. And it's super rewarding. Amazing boss fights, a very lengthy campaign. If I had one complaint against this game, as well as the entire Ninja Gaiden 3D series, is that there is no level select. If you want to play this game, you must do it from beginning to end. But it's not a huge problem because these games are so good. I replayed this tons of times on different difficulties. Please check out Ninja Gaiden. Before moving on to Black, I just want to mention that this game did have a sizable amount of DLC, and this was in the early days of DLC. They were called Hurricane Packs, and what they were was, there was Hurricane Pack 1, which was an enhanced version of the campaign that added some weapons and moves, like a counter and the famous Lunar Staff, and there was Hurricane Pack 2, which is kind of a gauntlet of... Uh, enemy encounters through an arena with new bosses that you'd have to fight through. And uh, yeah, it was a really good implementation back when DLC used to be a cool and exciting thing. That's no longer the case, but it was back then. Uh, unfortunately, this version of the game is not backwards compatible or has never been re-released. You're going to find the Sigma uh, versions most commonly. They're the ones that have just been recently announced for the Xbox One and PS4. However, this version was special for a new number of reasons. Uh, number one, you can actually unlock Ninja Gaiden 1, 2, and 3 on the NES in this game. Like, they're just the full games in here. And that has been stripped from all future releases, and that's a real shame. 
So if you want to play the original Ninja Gaiden, well, not NES original, but the original Xbox Ninja Gaiden, you still have to get it on the original Xbox. Not worth a lot, but I'll tell you this game holds up. And let's move on to its direct remake, which came out a year later, very late in the Xbox's life in 2005, and that is Ninja Gaiden Black. Probably the most revered game in this series, and for a number of reasons. What this is, is a re-release of the original game with elements of the Hurricane Packs incorporated into the main campaign, kind of spliced in in the best way possible, and refined to a razor sheen. This game is even more difficult, with more difficulty options, including the Ninja Dog, the easy mode where you have to wear a pink ribbon, uh, you know, as a mark of shame throughout the game. I think it looks cool. Uh, the pink ribbon's kind of, you know, stylish, but, you, you know, it, it is more of a mark of shame. And it has Master Ninja mode, which will really test you. But, um, yeah, this is kind of the ultimate version of the game. It did remove, however, these three NES games found in the original version, but it replaced it with Ninja Gaiden Arcade, kind of a forgotten title, uh, instead. So you get one arcade game, not really a substitute for three NES games, but it's still a nice bonus. But, yeah, you're going to get more weapons, you're going to get more enemies, you're going to get more bosses in this version. Um, so check this one out. I strongly suggest this over the Ninja Gaiden Sigma version. Reason being, Ninja Gaiden Sigma is generally seen as an easy, chopped up version. It had a different director. The infamous Tobunobu Itagaki uh, was the at the helm of the Dead or Alive and Ninja Gun series for a number of years. He, However, he had nothing to do with the Sigma series, and it kind of shows the guy did have a sense of style. If you take a look at the guy, you'll see what I'm talking about. However, uh, Sigma just is lacking in a lot of areas. The difficulty, the enemy placements, it's all different. And it doesn't feel quite right to me having gone through these first two titles. I would strongly suggest that if you only play one version of Ninja Gaiden 1, you get black. Luckily, this is backwards compatible on the Xbox One and Series X, and it looks amazing. So please, Ninja Gaiden or Ninja Gaiden Black, you gotta play them. I suggest these versions. These are the some of, if not the best games on the original Xbox. Check them out. And next, you didn't think we were going to talk Dead or Alive without this next famous exclusive. I'm not afraid to say I have this. I love this game. And that is Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball. Yeah, this is a good game. I don't want to hear any words to the contrary. So, before Ninja Gaiden, and af but after Dead or Alive 3, Tobinobu Itagaki, who, please look up the history on this guy. It's interesting. I don't want to get it into here. Released this game. So... With the female models, the female characters of Dare Alive 3 being so popular, it would only make sense that they would be put into another game, kind of accentuating those features, and that is this game. So the plot of this game is that Zack, a fighter from Dare Alive 3, who is voiced by Dennis Rodman of NBA fame, um, hosts uh, or says he is hosting a tournament on an island and invites all the female fighters. However, there's no, no tournament. There's just a ton of fun in the sun, and that's what they end up having. They play volleyball, they go to the pool, they play the hopping game. It is exactly what it sounds like. And you as the player have uh, the, the task of picking one of the girls and then finding a volleyball partner by giving them gifts that they like from the shop, including bikinis and, and uh, suntan lotion that changes the color of their skin and uh, hair ties. And it's, yeah, you, you dress up, you're, you're, you're pretty dull in this game. But the volleyball in this game is incredibly simple, but really fun and addicting. And at night during uh, on the island, because there's like a, a pseudo in-game clock in this game, you go to a casino, and that's where I spend about 95% of my time in this game. There's only three games. There's blackjack, there's roulette, and there is poker. But I can't get enough of it. Uh, the, the gambling in this game is simple, but incredibly addicting and fun. Also, the soundtrack in this must have been very expensive. It has like Christina Aguilera and Bob Marley tracks, uh, which is just shocking to me. So yeah, for Dead or Alive Volleyball, a cheesecake video game where you have just very pretty anime girls playing volleyball, you have fucking... Dennis Rodman and, and, and Christina Aguilera involved. But it is a good game, and there were some really surprising secrets about it. You have previews for the then-upcoming Ninja Gaiden, which couldn't be found anywhere else, which is very interesting. Um, and as well, it was also the introduction of the character Lisa, who would go on to be La Mariposa in Dead or Alive 4, so this was the first um, appearance of a soon-to-be famous character. So yeah, Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball. Yeah, it's cheesecakey, but it is a fun game, all kidding aside. 
with a lot of cool features. And as a collector's note, if you get it, there is of course the disc and manual, but uh, it also came with a holographic card that's not really holographic. The girls' uh, faces don't change too much there, but it's nice to have, so make sure you get that. It's pretty cheap. It's not getting a re-release with all that voice work in it. So yeah, Dead or Alive Volleyball, an original Xbox classic. Yeah, I said it, Dead or Alive Volleyball. I love it. So. Sticking with the weird, but moving away from Tecmo and back to From Software, we're going to talk about a game that I've mentioned before on my Rare Games video. Uh, this is my most valuable and probably my rarest original Xbox game. Uh, and that would be the infamous Metal Wolf Chaos. Yes. So, just to start, this game got a miraculous, just like Stubbs the Zombie, but maybe even more so, miraculous re-release on the PS4 and Xbox One last year. Um, however, for almost 15 years, it was an original Xbox exclusive. So this game has an incredibly his, uh, interesting plot and history. Let's start with the plot. The plot is you play as the president of the United States, Michael Wilson, in his mech fighting the vice president of the United States, Richard Hawk, in his mech for dominance of the United States of America. It is amazing. So... <laughs> the development of this game, the release of this game. Let's talk about this. This was a late life original Xbox title, late 2004, released only in Japan with a full English dub. Yeah, this didn't sell well, you can imagine. The Xbox was never popular in Japan, and this is a game about America. Uh, and it was made by From Software. It runs on the Otogi engine. It has fully destructible environments. It's really fun. You have a, It's played for... I don't know if it's played for laughs, but it is funny. It's definitely eccentric. It's exaggerated. You fight on the White House lawn. You fight through New York City and Miami and San Francisco, blowing things up, trying to save the United States that's simultaneously completely blowing it up. Maybe that's most likely why it never got re-released here for many, many, many years. But uh, yeah, it's really fun. You're, for years, you couldn't find this anywhere else. Uh, the, these physical copies are very expensive. Now, like I said, it was a Japanese only release for a console no one had over there. However, luckily, you can go get that re-release. However, I will say this, uh, the original Xbox version had a certain ghosting effect, like an aliasing effect, and I actually liked it a lot, especially on older TVs. It kind of added a sense of, I don't know, like a mysterious aura to the game. It had like a glow to it, and that's kind of lost in the HD version, but it's not a big deal. The HD version's kind of objectively better. So please check that out. That's like $20. There's nothing else like this. And remember, this is the team that would go on to make Sekiro, Demon Souls, Dark Souls, and Bloodborne. They all started right here, Metal Wolf Chaos. Check it out. Um, go for this version if you have a modded Xbox and you have some extra change. Otherwise, get the re-release. Metal Wolf Chaos, a gem. So, when talking about interesting Xbox exclusives, I'm gonna have to make some room here. Capcom often doesn't come to mind. However, they sure as hell did make two very special exclusives on the original Xbox, uh, and that would be the Steel Battalion series. So these were mech games, but not just any mech games. No, 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 no. These were not like Mech Assault. The main difference being, or the biggest thing about these games are the control. You can't control these with just a regular Duke or S Xbox controller. You need, and forgive me, I'm gonna have a little trouble getting this on the table, one of these magnificent bastards. This 40 button two stick controller. Oh, don't let me forget the foot pedal. Yeah, you also need the foot pedal. You can't forget that the three prong foot pedal. You need to get this bad boy to control this game. Um, yeah, see that by the way? That's the, uh, that's the eject button right there. Uh, so yeah, you. this is more of a mech sim than anything. I don't have room on the table. I'm gonna have to put the foot pedal down. This is more of a mech sim game than anything where originally these game, this controller came in a massive box and basically came with a PDF file uh, to learn how to control it. There are things on this controller that you may never touch. There's a windshield button, wiper button on this in case your, uh, the, the, the cockpit of your mech gets dirty. There, like I said, the eject button, if you're in trouble, you hit this. I believe it deletes your save. That's why there's plastic on it. This, this was insane. I don't have that original box. Uh, it's very hard to find. These were very limited. They were released once, and the re-release has different colored buttons, but otherwise it is functionally identical. And uh, yeah, 
This isn't getting released. It's impossible. So if you want to play Steel Battalion, a mech simulator game, you're going to need to get an original Xbox and drop a few hundred bucks to get one of these controllers. So there's two games on there. There's the original Steel Battalion, which is strangely completely single player. Yeah, you at first, you would get this game and this controller and play with nobody else. Not that many people had this, but an interesting note. And then they went in the other direction a few years later with Steel Battalion Line of Contact, uh, which was an online only game. Yeah, this, this could not be played... Uh, locally and it can't be played at all anymore because uh, about a year and a half after it's released the Xbox Live servers for when it down went down but hey if you're gonna get the controller in the first game you might as well get the whole Steel Battalion collection uh, on the original Xbox and like I don't see Capcom reference this game anywhere you're not gonna get like uh, a Steel Battalion mech in Marvel versus Capcom like that's just not gonna happen but um this is this is a legendary Famous, infamous, call it what you will, Xbox exclusive. Look at this thing. This thing is fantastic. A few years later, Capcom would release uh, Steel Battalion on the uh, third game on the Xbox One. I believe it was called Full Armed or Fully Armored, which was controlled with the Kinect with hand motions. It didn't work. No one liked it. It was hated. This actually works. You do need to go online if you don't get the original box like I didn't. You need to go online and download the PDF to learn how to control this. And after you spend about mm, a week learning, it does work and it works well. And it's really fun and unique. There's nothing else like this. Please check it out. If you have that kind of disposable income, it's a lot of fun. You're not getting it anywhere else. The Steel Battalion series, particularly Steel Battalion 1 by Capcom on the original Xbox. And that wraps up my talk on uh, some of the more weird, rare, and less talked about games on the original Xbox, but I do have a little bonus section I want to talk about. So, like I mentioned before, Xbox had a magazine running in North America, and many times uh, these magazines would come with demo and preview discs, as, as seen here. Uh, some of the titles came in just sleeves like this. Some would come in hard plastic ones like this. These are obviously better, easier for preservation purposes. And these were pretty unique. They'd usually have a demo or two on them and a bunch of previews. Um, and, you know, obviously these aren't needed now with digital distribution. You can watch trailers, play demos. But this was a nice way to do it beforehand. But two of these were really unique, and I just wanted to talk about them. There is a there is the uh, September 2003 demo disc. Uh, that's demo disc 22. This had a demo of Soul Calibur 2, one of my favorite games of all time. Xbox version, you need spawn. Uh, that's why I originally got this demo disc, the magazine with this, is to play the Soul Calibur 2 demo. However, this is how I discovered Otogi. Otogi has a demo on this game. But it's unique. It is a late level of Otogi with enemies found from other parts of the games in that level. It is a unique level, basically, uh, of Otogi only found on this disc. So when you pick up Otogi, which you should, and you uh, end up loving it, which you will, and you want a little bit more, a little bit more unique action, find Demo Disc 22 from September 2003 to get an exclusive uh, level uh, remix, as it were. It's basically a level remix with different enemies. So yeah, and the other one, uh, there's two versions of this. I'm not sure how this would end up being, but that is the uh, <laughs> demo disc from Holiday 2004, Demo Disc 39. This is actually the only way to play an English American or North American version, as it were, of Metal Wolf Chaos. On the back of this disc, uh, it has something listed as a explosive hidden demo. Uh, let's see if I can find, right there, if you can see that, it says explosive hidden demo. That was Metal Wolf Chaos. On the, and this, as far as I know, is the only time the, the, the uh, magazine discs did this. You entered an exclusive code, you entered a, a secret code on the menu screen. It was like a 10 button combination, and it would unlock a middle level of Metal Wolf Chaos. I don't know why it was hidden. Why would you hide a demo? This whole point of these things was to advertise them. And, <laughs> When you play it and beat that level, it says coming soon. It never came out in North America. So there's a hidden demo of a game that was never released on a demo disc from a magazine that not many people bought. It's an interesting curio. I don't know how much these are worth these days. I picked these up at the time of release. I picked up one, a little, one copy a little bit later. It was dirt cheap. But check it out as a piece of Xbox history, the demo disc. I miss things like these. So that kind of does it. That wraps up our talk uh, of the original Xbox. Now, as you can see, the original Xbox is, uh, was really coming out of the, coming swinging at the PS2 and GameCube. And even though it will always be known uh, as the Halo box or the Halo 2 box, I hope that you found a bit more appreciation for this console and its weird library of unique and exclusive games. Um, yet again, 
I hope that more people out there begin to respect this big uh, gargantuan brick of a console. I know it was never popular outside North America, but that's a shame. And uh, uh, luckily, it has garnered better recognition. Uh, the Xbox One struggled a lot throughout its lifetime, but I believe the Xbox Series X is off to a decent start. There's no good exclusives, but there's some amazing backwards compatibility, and I love that because, as you can see, there's some really special titles that I hope future generations get to play. So I hope that Microsoft goes back to making really fantastic exclusives that you can't find anywhere else, at the same time expanding their back catalog though, that so new generations can catch up on some of these classic titles. So thank you for joining me. I'm sure we'll make more Xbox videos in the future because there's more to talk about. Please look for my other videos where we talk about the weird, the rare, and the expensive on other consoles. My name has been Mike. This is Chip Damage, and take care of yourself. Thank you.